webinar now. So my name is Janet McLean, and I work with Family Caregivers of British Columbia, and I am the Education and Engagement Lead. And tonight, as our presenter, we have Mavis Gibson from Safe Care BC. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Family Caregivers of BC, if you don't know about us. We are a nonprofit charity in British Columbia dedicated 100% to the well-being of family caregivers. We were the first provincial organization in Canada and have actually been around for 28 years and serving BC across the whole province since 2010 and the last four years have received funding from the Ministry of Health to do that and in particular um, things like these webinars. And 100% of our staff have been caregivers and 60 cent, sorry, 60 percent of our board members. So we, we like to think that we understand the caregiving journey and all that's involved. We do a number of different things, um, including webinars. And this slide is just to encourage you to go on our website. So the, the address for that is www.familycaregiversbc.ca. And we split our work into three areas. So our caregiver support, we have a call line, and we have one-on-one -on -one caregiver coaching. And that really does provide an opportunity for caregivers to do navigation, um, problem solving, and receive some um, support in thinking things through. We also um, sponsor support groups throughout the province. We have um, materials for setting up peer support groups, and we have an extensive online resource center. So again, just encourage you to hop on our website and have a look around. Um, we're just thrilled to have Mavis Gibson with us tonight. And Mavis works for Safe Care BC, which in British Columbia is an organization um, that addresses um, the safety of workers in the continuing care sector. And so um, that would be anybody who's working in home support. And maybe Mavis can tell us a little bit about that. But in terms of Mavis's background, we were chatting a bit before you folks joined us. And Mavis um, started out as an RN and worked in, has worked in community services and in acute care in the healthcare sector, and then got into the very um, beginnings of when you know, injury prevention became a big focus for for healthcare workers, and so did a lot of curriculum development in that area. And so she's, as this slide says, has over 20 years of experience in health safety and employee wellness and disability management, and has worked throughout BC's public health and education sectors, and even founded a company around that. Um, so we're just thrilled to have Mavis um, do this presentation for us tonight. She recently, she's only been with Safe Care BC for two months. <laughs> So she's incredibly brave to be doing this, and she is the acting director of work, workplace health and safety programs there. So um, yeah, that's it's it's terrific. So what I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to change layouts one more time, and this will bring up Mavis's presentation, and uh, I'll let Mavis take it from there. Okay, why is this not? I'm going to let you take charge of the presentation. That's wonderful, and thank you, Janet, and, and thank you to the family caregivers for this uh, opportunity to speak with everyone t today. Um, as, as Janet has said, my name is Mavis, and uh, Mavis Gibson, and I'm the, currently the Acting Director of Workplace Health and Safety Programs for Safe Care BC. And, and just, you know, a little bit of background. Oh, I'm not progressing my slides. Let me try it. Um, can you there see we go. the Got it. There you go. Okay. Got it. Yep. Um, just a little bit about a Safe Care BC. First, it is an industry-funded, it's nonprofit, and we're working to ensure injury-free, safe working conditions for continuing care workers across the province of BC. Our mandate is really to strive to ensure injury-free, safe working conditions for our continuing care workers through prevention training, education and resources again throughout the province. And what's interesting about Safe Care is we actually service the needs of about 825 employers in BC and over 29,000 community support workers spanning both long-term care and home support. Wow, that's a lot. It's a lot. It's actually larger than any one health authority in uh, BC. That, that, yeah, that's pretty amazing. 
it, and it's very new. Safe Care has been, it's, it's still in its infancy. We're uh, just sliding into four years of, uh, since inception. Uh, we actually spawned from a need that was addressed through the BC Care Providers uh, because they too saw the need uh, to support the, the community care workers and um, sort of transitioning over into the family care providers as well. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, just looking at, at uh, safe care, our vision is really to provide a safe, healthy, and injury-free workplace in the continuing care sector. And our mission is really to empower those working in the continuing care sector to create safer, healthier workplaces, looking at fostering some good uh, culture around safety, um, and using some strong evidence-based education, a lot of leadership, and a lot of collaboration through this whole process. Um, one of the interesting things uh, about uh, the continuing care industry, and, and actually healthcare in general, but specifically in the continuing care and home care areas is overexertion, or the, what we call soft tissue type sprains and strain injuries, are the most common type of injury for people who provide care to individuals in long-term care and, and the community sector. Uh, what's interesting there, um, in addition to be the number one cause of injuries at 42%, in the com continuing care long-term and home care, we are four times the average for work-related injuries related to overexertion. And when we look at sort of our population, and, and clearly we don't have statistics on what happens in the home, but if we're looking at four times the industry average for injuries to, to continuing care workers, that same risk, risk uh, presents itself for the family caregivers because you're doing the same type of work. And so that's why we really value this sort of partnership between Safe Care BC and fam family caregivers because you are faced with the same issues. And, you know, it's really, this is a team of people coming together, looking how best to support your loved ones. And, and so I'm thrilled to have the opportunity just to share some of, you know, our insight and a bit of our knowledge. We, we do recognize that, that many people may not have exposure to or knowledge about some safe practices um, and yet they're, they're in the situation where they are providing that, that hands-on physical care to their loved ones. Uh, so we do have lots of tips and tools and strategies. I'm going to share some of them with you tonight um, because they do relate to both um, community caregivers and to you as family caregivers. So the things I'm going to uh, sort of touch on tonight, we have five sort of objectives. The first is really to define what an injury is and, and what does it look like. A, a lot of times people you may not even be aware that they're, they're walking down a path of, of an injury and, and it's just accumulative. So it, we'll talk a lot about what that looks like and what to expect and then sort of move into, you know, how injuries affect both you as a caregiver and your families, including the person in your care. Um, how those injuries occur, and then we'll sort of go into some practical tips on how to reduce that risk, and then how injuries can be prevented and, and how to recognize when to ask for help. So what is a soft tissue injury? Soft tissue injuries are really uh, a disorder of muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints, nerves, blood vessels, and all the related um, soft tissues or related soft tissues, and it includes things like sprains and strains, uh, it can be inflammation, and it's really anything that causes harm or damage to you as an individual. The interesting thing is soft tissue injuries can be sudden, uh, so it's a one-time traumatic event like um, um, helping your family member transfer to a chair and you get a sudden pain in your shoulder or your back or helping them turn in bed and, you know, trying to reach while they're doing something. So it's a very specific incident. Or it can be chronic and accumulative um, where, where it happens over months or years and, and it's caused by a whole combination of different risk factors. And we see a lot of chronic injuries in home support workers as a result of, of 
providing care to a number of clients on a daily basis. So they're coming in and out of homes, um, you know, maybe dealing with as many as, as 20 individuals over the course of a day. Um, and that's why I say if, if, if our members are seeing those injuries, then you as family care providers are very likely seeing the same sorts of risks. So the principles that we have for the home support workers are exactly the same principles that apply to you as family care providers. So recognizing early signs and symptoms of injury is so important because early treatment and recovery reduces the risk of a serious injury down the road. So putting things off is not the way to go. They need to be treated right away. Um, interesting, this morning I, I had an own, my own personal experience. I'm suffering from tendonitis in an arm, and I finally you know, said I need to go see my doctor and discuss a little bit further. And she said, Mavis, you have to get on this, and you have to get on this now or down the road you're going to have a lot more serious symptoms. And I thought, wow, isn't that exactly what I'm talking about tonight is, <laughs> is you know, recognizing it early and doing yeah. something about it. Because they, they, you know, they can start as a, a sudden sharp pain and then you know you have distinct injury. Or they can start as sort of a dull ache that just increases over time and it just sort of malingers and one day you wake up and go, oh, my gosh, you know, what, what's going on? Um, you can see things like uh, the typical injury, you would see some redness, some swelling, maybe some loss of your joint movement, maybe some muscle, muscle wasting where it's getting smaller and that's because you're not using that limb as much as you used to. Um, you might start to feel symptoms, maybe pain that's shooting and that's usually one that takes you to the doctor. But if it's dull or kind of aching and throbbing, you tend not to. You know, if it's a little tender, feels a little bit weak, you might not be, you know, taking it very serious as opposed to those sharp, stabbing-type pains. So the question is, how does an injury affect the caregiver and the family member? And um, Any time we assist, support, reposition, or otherwise move a person, we're putting ourselves at risk. And I always, you know, put it to the fact that, you know, if people are different than, moving people, pardon me, are different than uh, moving boxes. Boxes are really predictable. They don't offer any resistance, and, you know, provided the box is strong enough to hold whatever's in it, the only two factors that you have to consider are its size and its weight. And, you know, if that box becomes heavy or awkward, you can just put it down. But realistically, the same can't be said for people, especially for people we care about, people who are family. And their abilities do change over time and sometimes by the minute. And they are impacted by a number of different things. Uh, it can be things like, you know, lack of sleep, fatigue, hunger, their hydration levels, if they've got pain, or maybe they've just had pain medication and they're feeling a little disorientated. Um, it can be because of loss of concentration. Maybe they're a bit confused or distracted. Or maybe they're just feeling nervous or afraid. And, and you know, so that impacts how they react to us. And, and so any time we're about to move them, we do put ourselves at risk. And we also put the safety and health of our family at risk and, and our family member that we care about. So even the slightest injury to ourselves has the true potential to result in something much more serious with, with potential impact to the family member that you're caring for. So, you know, we look at it and we say the stakes are really high. Um, for you as, as a caregiver, you might experience some short long-term pain and um, the injuries may impact your quality of life. Um, maybe you can't do the things that you could before, and you know maybe you're feeling bad about the fact that you can't provide the care to your loved ones the way you did before, so you sort of have this uh, lower self-esteem. You're not feeling as good about yourself, um, and it can cause stress in the family because maybe you can't carry out your 
own activities the way you used to. And the stakes are also very high for your family member who's in your care. There's, there's an increased risk of injury. Um, perhaps you can't lift or support them the way you used to be able to, so you may be feeling weakness. You might be exposing them to potential that you can't support them the way they did physically. Um, and that may lead to, you know, increased risk of falls, or maybe you can't perform the care as well as you did before. So the safest care for you is definitely the safest care for your family member that you're caring for as well. Um, and in all walks of life, it's so important to recognize the risks before you undertake the task. Nowhere is it more important than when caring for one of your loved ones. So how do injuries occur? The most frequent body part to be injured is the back. But there's also soft tissue injuries that occur in your fingers. So if you're changing sheets and gripping sheets and pulling with your fingers, you can have soft tissue injuries there. You can have a soft tissue injury in your hands, your wrists and elbows, your shoulders, your neck and your knees. And so what we like to look at is, is how can we engage our, the large muscles, the, the muscles that are in your thighs and your butt, which are much larger and much stronger than those smaller muscles of your back, your fingers, your wrists. Um, and using those big muscles as much as you possibly can reduces the risk of injury to those smaller muscles. So using large muscles, um, sometimes it's a bit of a trick, um, but we're going to walk through and hopefully I'll give you some, some ways where you can recognize when you can engage those large muscles and, and take the weight off of your smaller ones. The, the four different movements that we actually look at when um, where someone can hurt themselves are awkward posture, force, duration, and repetition. So in terms of awkward posture, I'm sure all of you can relate to this in one way or another, but they, they occur when, when any part of your body bends or twists too much and it's outside of your normal comfort range. So it's outside your stretching, reaching, bending, those sorts of things. Um, and it usually occurs in combination with something else. And when, when it happens in a combination with something else, there's even a greater risk of injury. So an example, when you're helping your family member in the bath, typically you're leaning over them and you may end up actually being leaning over them and supporting them at the same time. So now you're bent and you've got some weight attached to it. Uh, another example is that the picture shows here in the slides is when you bend from the waist say to lift a uh, family member's foot onto a footrest of a, a wheelchair or something like that. If you're bending from the waist, you're creating an awk awkward posture in your back because your back isn't meant to bend that way. And because you're also lifting the weight of his or her foot, you're increasing the risk of injury. Um, same can be said for if you're uh, you know, moving an individual in bed um, and you might be pulling, twisting, turning all at the same time, creating this tremendously awkward posture um, that might also include force or some weight to it. So the best rule of thumb is to try and maintain a neutral posture. A neutral posture is where your back um, is basically straight. It's in a natural position. Your head is aligned with your shoulders. Your shoulders are aligned with your hips and your hips aligned with your feet. Um, so a quick example, you know, to sort of feel what a natural posture is, is I challenge you all to check where your shoulders are right now. And if you're, if you're like me, I often find my shoulders somewhere close to my ears. That is not a natural posture. You're not in a neutral zone. If you drop them down and pull them back, that becomes a neutral posture because your shoulders are now aligned with your hips. And at that point, there's no strain on your muscles. And, and you can feel it. If you're doing it right now as I'm doing it, you can feel 
a release of tension, and, and your shoulders will actually feel better. And this, the same is for backs. When you're bending forward at the waist, your muscles have to work so much harder than if your back is straight, where your shoulders are lined up with your hips and, and your neck is aligned with your shoulders, just like the diagram on the, the right-hand side of the screen. And Mavis, I just have to jump in here and say, I've got turtleneck. <laughs> and oh, it's from yeah. working at a computer. Like, I know that my neck is always forward. And I think even without computers, like, we tend to crane our necks forward as well. We do. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I think I talk about it a little bit later on, but I'll talk about it right now, is, is this whole sort of issue of micro breaks. And they're now saying, if you're sitting at a computer, um, just as that sort of getting neutral posture, you should be up and moving no less frequent than every 20 minutes. And it includes arching and stretching and moving your neck and getting your neck pushed back because you're out of, you're out of sync and you will sustain an injury with a turtleneck, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing, and and we you know, tend to do it. It's 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 amazing how we just get used to it, mm -hmm. and until something goes wrong, right? Yeah. So the second type of injury that we see are injuries that are resulting from force, and force really means um, we're talking about weight, and it's the amount of effort that you use to do a task. So the more effort or the heavier the weight, obviously the higher the risk for injury. And if there's resistance added to that, the risk of injury becomes even higher. So when we look at family caregivers, when, you're, when you support your family's weight, so you're helping them transfer from the bed to the wheelchair. That's a force, and there's a risk there. But if your family member is feeling uncertain or a little nervous, and grabs onto the bed rail as you're doing that transfer, now you've got resistance on top of it, and that heightens the risk of you being injured because you've got force and resistance. You know, we kind of put it sort of in, in basic terms. You know, if you think of yourself as, as pushing a bed with the brakes on, you're not going to go very far. You've got a lot of resistance. You, it takes a lot of force and a lot of resistance. And then if you and try Maureen, and do Maureen just brought up the same example, Mavis, about shifting the wheelchair or adjusting someone in the wheelchair. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you know, if you're doing that and and now you've got say let's say you've got the wheelchair and you're adjusting someone in it and that wheelchair happens to be on carpet as well, you're increasing it even more. So it's all these things of this force and resistance. Uh, is very challenging. And thank you, Maureen, for your input. That's excellent. The third type of injury occurs for duration. We often call this static postures. It's when you're in the same position for a long time. Um, and the longer you keep that position, the greater the risk is. So an example of duration is you're holding, say, a family's member's arm or leg for an extended period of time, and you're changing them or doing some foot care or something like that, and you're in that static position. And a really great way to understand what, what that static or long duration is if you ever do an invisible chair on yourself. And so you go up against the wall and you pretend there's a chair <laughs> and you, you pretend you're sitting, right? But there's no chair there. Oh. And realize how little time it takes for your thigh muscles to start mm. to feel tired. And if it takes you, let's say it takes you five minutes to feel that your thighs are tired. Now put a 30-pound weight in your arms and try it again. And you're going to find that your legs will tire much quicker. And so you're adding weight to this whole duration. And, and it's amazing the amount of stress that, that you put on your, even your large muscles at that point. Same thing happens when you're helping your family member. Um, maybe you're supporting them in the bath. Um, so you're doing their care, but also supporting them at the same time. Or you're supporting their leg um, while you're helping them put on stockings, so you're leaning over 
and you're supporting, so now you're in a static position. Um, or maybe you're changing sheets, and so you're holding them on their side or supporting them on their side while you're trying to change seats. So now you've got this sort of static, long duration while you're holding them. You probably also have your wrist bent at the same time uh, because you're holding them and trying to pull sheets. So you've got some awkward postures. You're probably bent forward a little bit, so you're not neutral. Awkward postures, and you're holding them for a period in time, so you've got duration. Um, these situations, it typically is the small muscles that are impacted, and those are the ones that are at major risk of injury at that point in time. And the fourth type of situation where we see injuries is repetition. And that's where we use the same muscles over and over and over again. It's called muscle fatigue and exhaustion. So, so any task or series of similar tasks where, where there's not enough time to let your muscles rest, to let those tired muscles sort of, you know, relax and get back into a, a healthy state. Any time when there isn't that time, it will increase the risk of injury. Typically, you'll see those types of injuries are like your upper limb type things. So it's like your wrists, your elbows, shoulders are really the body parts that tend to, to be injured through repetitious activity. Um, muscles of the lower back may also be injured over time, um, but it's definitely over time for them. Um, so if I was looking at sort of things that we do every day um, that are examples of repetitious things that we don't even think about, it would be things like um, pushing and pulling a vacuum cleaner over carpet. It's very repetitious. You're using the muscles typically in your forearm. Um, you know, an example of adding force to this, I've done it myself, is try washing carpets. You know, the difference between <laughs> vacuuming and then using a, a carpet cleaner. A lot more resistance, a lot more weight, body fatigue a lot faster. Um, because you're, you're using all those small muscles in your wrists and arms. Um, but you are also putting stress on your muscles in your lower back because you typically are bent forward slightly while you're doing that task. So if you think of it and you say, mm, I'm doing some care for my family member and I am supporting them, I'm changing their sheets and they're on their side, I'm supporting them, but that only takes me five minutes. But then you go and vacuum and you've got that slightly forward bent posture you are creating that repetitious action. You haven't really changed the muscle groups that you're using. Um, so combining those sort of things like vacuuming with other activities uh, while you're supporting your family member increases the risk of you hurting yourself. So it's really important to recognize what repetition is, and it's not just doing the same task over and over. It can be using the same muscle groups over and over, and your tasks may be different. There's also some other factors that can result in injury. And, and you know, we've touched on a lot of them already, but it's really important to mention them again because it can be so difficult to predict when these sorts of things come into play. And, and there's no question that, that your family member's physical or mental state can change at any time, and it, it can make it easier or harder to complete that activity. So, you know, if they're tired or in pain or they've just had some pain medication and, and they're reacting differently, uh, maybe they're unsure of what's happening or unsure of what it is that, that you want from them. Uh, they might respond differently and without even meaning to. Um, they can actually increase the risk of your sustaining an injury. So when your family member's physical or mental state declines, you may need to look to do things differently. And it's really important to recognize those changes before you start to provide the care. Um, you know, it's, it's something like maybe you notice that 
they're not really following your instructions well one day or they seem reluctant to do you know what it is you're asking of them um, maybe that pain is a factor and so she's a he or she's afraid to move um, you know maybe um, you know completing that task successfully without injury to yourself your family member it often depends on their willingness to work with you at that point and and so it's so important to think about what your family member is doing sort of how how they're behaving at that time rather than what we know they can do from past experience because sometimes what they could do before is not what they can do now and and it can be as as quickly as what they can do in the morning may not be the same as what they can do in the evening the other factors that that can come into play here is your the environment in your home and maybe not having the right equipment in place or maybe it's not working right um, maybe the furniture you know it's thinking about you you're using items and what's the layout of the furniture have things moved um, you know is there, is there clutter around is it making it difficult for you to to do that task so it's really important to to tune into that um, and if in all of that you're feeling that there's resistance from from your loved one uh, that it's you know they're not connecting with you they're, they're not doing what they normally do then a really good rule of thumb is if they resist really don't insist step back and sort of reassess what's going on because if there's resistance the risk of injury becomes much greater to both of you So now it comes to the fun part because now we can start to look at some practical tips on, on how to reduce injuries. And I'll give you some don'ts right off the bat because I like to get the don'ts off the table so we can really look at the do's. First off, I mean, I've, I've talked about it a lot, but the first don't is forward bending of your low back, especially if you're lifting or reaching or carrying a weight. That is just so hazardous. Um, and if you're reaching further than what your body is able to do. So think of it as, you know, if you're standing beside bed and you've got your loved one on their side and they're, they're nice and close to you, which is great, but now you're lifting across the bed with your other hand, that's a huge risk. You need to be looking at strategies where you're not doing that huge risk on top of, of you know, doing some forward bending of the low back. You want to look at avoiding those activities where there's some lifting and twisting, especially if it's in combination um, and if there's weight involved. Um, and lifting your family member on your own is a definite don't do it. Um, I know some people say we don't have a choice or, or maybe they don't look very heavy, but at that moment in time when you're supporting a family member and all of their weight or most of their weight there is a huge risk to you to sustain injury and I can tell you at that moment that if you sustain an injury so will they because you won't be able to support them at that point in time so that's that's a definite um, you know no don't try it um, and, and I can probably guess right now um, that some of you are thinking that you have to bend and twist, that you have to reach across to get things that are further than they should be. They're kind of out of your reach. Maybe it's not that comfortable. But there are ways to, for you to avoid those motions and reduce that risk. And, and the first step is always protecting yourself and your family member. Um, is to, to look at what you're doing and figure out how you can make it safe for both of you. So when we look at how do we avoid an awkward posture, you know, and it, we can do the basics. Of it, the basics being um, remember to keep that neutral posture. Think about how to use your thigh and butt muscles to do most of the heavy lifting. 
um, sort of a standard is keep your feet apart. You, you do always want a nice wide stance. If your feet are close together, that decreases your stability and your balance, um, which increases the risk. So remembering to keep those feet, you know, at least shoulder width apart. Bend your knees. I always say it's okay to stick your butt out at this point because even if you can see the picture here um, of an individual who's bending at the knees and she's got her butt out a bit, her back is nice and straight as opposed to leaning forward and, and getting out of that neutral posture. She's got a really nice neutral posture there by sticking her butt out. Um, and avoid twisting and bending at the same time. We know that. So when it comes to awkward postures as a general rule, Plan ahead, and if you can put everything that you need to do the task near you so that you don't have to bend and twist, you're light years ahead. Uh, and make sure there isn't clutter, and if, if there is, move things so that you don't have to reach, don't have to stretch. When you're transferring or repositioning turning, make sure you always have that really strong base of support. Keep your shoulders, your feet shoulder width apart. And if you can, a great rule of thumb is, in, in those positions, is to put one foot in front of the other. And if you bend your knees at that point, you'll keep your back straight. So if you've got your, you know, a nice wide stance, one foot in front of the other, bend your knees a bit. You're in a really good position, and you can you can really adjust. You know, if, if there's a weight balance issue, you're in a great position to recover quickly rather than putting strain on your back. So, Mavis, uh, Maureen has asked a question yeah. here. Um, she's asking if there's an alternative for bending at the knees because she has arthritis, which makes it difficult and treacherous. There probably is, and, I, you know, there's a couple different things that we can talk about uh, for that very thing, and it's going to be really moving your loved one closer to you. And, I can, and I'll, I'll touch on it as we go through. And don't let me forget, Maureen, um, sure. because um, if you do have arthritis in your knees, it does become very difficult. And, and so you have to compensate in another way. So as we go through, don't let me forget. And hopefully yep. I'll, I'll be I'll... able to, to address this further with you. Yep, you bet. Um, um, so scenario would be like if you're bathing, um, you really want to reduce the amount of bending and twisting. So try sitting on a, on a stool, and if it can be slightly lower than the, the side of the tub, um, and make it, it makes it so that you're not leaning over the tub. If you're leaning over the tub, you're at horrendous risk. If you're sitting on a stool, you're reducing that risk a bit. And, and um, you know, even on that stool, if you're facing your loved one, you can, again, stick your butt out. Don't sit on the stool and then bend forward. You're not, you're not changing anything. But if you can sit back on the stool and get your butt out behind you, then you can keep a nice straight back, a neutral posture. And I would also suggest if you have all the bathing supplies right there, and if possible, like right on the side of the bath or in like a bath caddy, because the risk is always if you're leaning, you're sitting on a stool, you're leaning forward, you get a nice straight posture, but the scrub brush is to your right, and now you're twisting while you're supporting. So now you're creating this awkward posture. So keeping everything in line and really close to you is very important, and, and to take those little micro bakes we talked about. So if you're you know in that awkward posture, beware of that awkward posture, and take those breaks and do the, use the opposite muscle group. So if you are feeling your back is taking that weight because you're leaning forward, you need to lean backwards and stretch those muscles out. Another good trip, especially with bathing, and bathing is one of the most difficult ones to, to avoid those awkward postures for sure. But if you have grab bars in the bathing area, you can use the grab bars yourself and support yourself uh, by putting one hand on that grab bar while washing with the other hand. So now you're taking some of the weight and that that extended posture um, off of yourself and you're, you're putting it onto your arm so you're giving yourself better balance. Another one uh, that we don't think about 
often unless you're crazy like me and I tend to do bulk cooking and then I freeze it um, just it makes it easier for me is to make sure that, that when you are doing that and all that food preparation that your countertop is at, at a comfortable height um, what you often see is is the countertop can be too high for some people and if it is then your wrists and shoulders are in an awkward posture and if you're chopping and slicing, you now you're going to add force to it. So it's really important to take a look at that counter height and see if you're actually finding that your shoulders are coming up to accommodate the chopping. And if they are, then you need to adjust that, whether that's step, standing on the small stool or you know, a couple books, whatever it takes, to get your shoulders into that nice neutral posture where they're not climbing up in your ears or you're not stretching. So tricks for this applied force. Um, applying force, you know, sometimes it's predictable and sometimes it's very unpredictable. So it's, it's really important to understand the risk and, and always look for ways to reduce it before you start that activity. And I know I say that over and over again, but I, you know, I can't help but say it over and over again. It is so important. Um, whether that's you know doing uh, care for your loved one or whether it's doing household chores, uh, first thing is to always make sure those wheelchairs are well maintained. Um, two things there that that they roll easy, they turn easy, but also that the brakes work well. And and to remember that um, those anytime you've got rough surfaces and inclines, it takes a lot more energy and a lot more force um, to use that equipment. So. Um, you know, you can't change the fact if you've got carpeting in a bedroom and that's where there, you can't change that. But you could consider if you're moving in a wheelchair is um, putting one of those mats down like you see for um, um, computer desks if it's carpet so that your wheelchair, if you're moving it around to, to assist the individual, say from bed to, to the wheelchair, that it moves easier because it's not on the carpet and it reduces the amount of force. That, that you're having to exude at that point. Some other sort of little hints, um, food preparation. You know, I don't know how many times or for how many years I used incredibly dull knives and I really didn't think about it um, until I started to experience some pain in my wrist. And the reality is if you're using dull knives to, to prepare food, you're having to put a lot more force to cut. And if you're doing it a lot, um, you're definitely adding force and the risk of injury. It's um, shoulders, wrists, wrists, pardon me, and your arms are the ones that are going to take the brunt of that. So you know, take a look at your knives and if they're dull, it's time to sharpen them up. Um, laundry is another one that we um, take for granted a lot of times. Um, you know, we tend to load a whole bunch in and you know, pull them all out. Um, but if they're wet or heavy, there's definitely risk there. So um, particularly if you have a top load washer and then you're leaning in to remove it. Really great trick here because um, washing machines we do see a lot in community care when they're doing uh, large loads. That is a source of injuries. A couple tricks. One is um, to support yourself, even though it sounds silly, just think of the posture. If you're leaning into the washing machine to get that sock that's at the very bottom, you are no longer in a neutral posture. You've got a nice bend happening on your back and you're at risk. So if it's a wet blanket at the bottom of that washing machine, now you've got weight and now you've got an increased risk. So some of the things you can do first off is support yourself on one elbow when you when you go to lean into the um, washing machine. The second trick, uh, and golfers do this perfectly. If anyone out there has ever watched golf on TV or pros on the, the circuit at all, uh, when they go and they reach into the hole to get their ball out of the, the hole, they will put one arm out with their golf club and they will support their weight with the golf club and you'll see their one of their back legs will go straight out behind them. So they're now putting their weight on the golf club and one leg 
and the other leg is straight out behind them. And the reason they do that is it keeps them in a neutral posture as they reach for the golf ball. So the same can be done. It's called a golfer's reach. That's actually exactly what they do. The same thing can be done in washing machines when you're having to bend over and pull things out. If you support your weight with one arm on the washing machine and extend one leg out behind you, you no longer are bending your spine, your neutral posture, and you can pull things out of the washing machine much safer. That's really helpful. I've never noticed that, but curlers do that too. Do they? When they're I don't watch much curling. Yeah. Well, I just was thinking about that because when they send the when they send the rock down the ice, they're they definitely they put the other arm down on the ice and use it as a slider. You're right. And put the leg back. So that's such You're a right. good example. Mm-hmm. I know it's it's amazing, and I think of all the and times Maureen's I look. And Maureen's saying she <laughs> tried it and it works. How oh, good! Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Um, the other thing, you know, it's so simple, but we do it all the time, is when we're carrying objects, like grocery bags. If you can't carry them close to yourself, then you shouldn't be carrying them. Because this the law of physics is, the further it is away from you, the heavier it gets. You know, I, you think of those big, heavy boxes. We, you know, I talked about boxes. People aren't boxes, and they certainly aren't. Um, but if you have a big, heavy, awkward box, and it's sticking out in front of you and you can't get it close, it becomes really, really heavy. So, um, you know, grocery bags, if you hold them close, they're not too bad. Put a heavy grocery bag and extend your arm out and feel how quickly your upper arm fatigues on that. So, again, you know, keeping that force, keeping things close to your body, um, keeping that neutral posture makes a huge difference in terms of reducing your risk. risk. And then when we look at um, prolonged duration or that sort of static posture, um, first thing to remember there is, you know, obviously if you're holding a position for a long time, you're at risk. Um, and it, that sort of position, it, it may or may not include holding weight, but definitely if there's a weight involved, it definitely increases the risk. Uh, just like the invisible chair and holding the 30 pounds, you will get tired much quicker. So again, when we're looking at prolonged duration, the best rules of thumb are to keep your feet further apart, uh, one ahead of the other. So if you're holding your loved one on their side in bed while you're doing some care, that forward foot makes a big difference. But another little trick is to raise your foot up. So if you have, say, like, it looks like a hospital bed and it's got a large side rail and you're dropping the side rails, put your foot up on that bottom rail. Um, I think the first people that ever discovered this had to be uh, the Western movies. And if you ever look at a Western movie and take a look at the bar in a Western movie, there's a foot rail. And the foot rail was put there so that they would stand and drink longer <laughs> if they put their foot on the rail. And right. that's where oh, my gosh. I know. And, and you look at any bar today, you know, go into a um, – you know, like a stand-up bar, they all have those foot rails. And that's why. It changes the whole body posture, takes the pressure away from your lower back, and it reduces that sort of prolonged duration problem. Another trick there um, is when you're doing dishes and you're standing at your kitchen sink, mm -hmm. um, you're, you, you're in the A, you're standing for a period of time, B, when you're washing dishes, you're bending slightly forward and you're not in a neutral posture. Quick way to fix it, open your, this cupboard door underneath your sink and put one foot up on the bottom ledge. It does the same as the railing in the uh, bar, so to speak, and it puts your back back into a neutral posture. It gets rid of that slight forward bend. Simple things. Um, other ones would be things like, um, and this might help you, Maureen, um, if you're doing care, say um, a foot care for your loved one, and you're doing it in bed because you, you can't, I'm thinking of you, you know, difficult to do foot care if you can't bend your knees would be better if they're in a chair, raise their feet, and you go into a chair so you can face them and, and rest your knees so you're not bending, and bring their feet up to you. 
so that you're not bending down and having to bend your knees with weight. So get the weight off of, of the limb that you're dealing with, whether it's in a chair and you're putting their feet up on your lap, or if you're in bed, it'd be something as simple as putting a few pillows under their legs so that if you're doing foot care, their foot is hanging over the pillow a little bit, and you are then able to do foot care without having to do the weight. You still would be leaning a bit. You still have to look at that awkward posture, but at least you're not supporting weight as well while you're doing that activity. And the same can be said if you're helping them with stockings, and, and maybe um, you're going to get up, and maybe your typical routine is you get them up, and then you put their stockings on um, when they're in the wheelchair. At that point, you're having to bend down to do that, maybe looking at it differently and saying, hmm, how about if I put their stockings on while they're still in bed so that I don't have to bend down to do that activity? You can even put shoes on while they're in bed rather than having to bend down to do that activity and sort of eliminate them. So it's really sort of looking at how can I rearrange one is the environment, um, and two is the way that I do things. And, and maybe there's ways when you start to sort of focus on it, um, maybe there's ways in which you can reduce the need to bend, lift, stretch as, as you um, provide them with their care. So repetition, and I've, I've mentioned this before as well, um, it, repetition is usually your wrists, elbows, shoulders, and, and basically your upper body. Um, and any activity can, can be repetitious if it's done for a long period of time or done frequently. Um, and obviously, if you're having to apply force or do it with an awkward posture at the same time, the risk becomes even greater. So it's really important to know that repetitious injuries, oh, pardon me, it's really important to know that repetitious injuries tend to be longer uh, to occur and they take longer to heal. So it's really important to avoid these types of injuries as much as possible. And if you start to feel a joint uh, symptoms, so you're starting to feel a little bit of pain, and you recognize it's from repetition, whatever that is, that's time when you need to act because these, these types of injuries tend to take months and months to heal. And they don't heal if you keep doing that same activity. So avoidance is the best rule of thumb. And to do that, um, simple way is first rotate your task. So if you can... Um, you know, do different things instead of, I often say it's, you know, if you have a house and you find that vacuuming um, gives you some symptoms, my question to you would be, why are you doing all the vacuuming at once? You could do one room a day if, if that reduced the amount of stress. So it's, it's looking at the task and saying, can I break it up? Can I change this around so that um, I'm not doing as frequent or as long? Is there a way to um, change arms? So say if you're vacuuming, right to left and then left to right so that your arms are taking a, a little bit of a break. And to really remember to take those micro breaks all through that time again. As we mentioned earlier, Janet, it's sort of at computers, it's every 20 minutes you need to, to take a break if you're goosenecking. I would yeah. suggest um, you know, doing personal care is even more frequent mm -hmm. because typically you've got any number of the awkward posture, the force, the duration. You know, it's a, usually it's sort of a a soup of different things that that you're experiencing. So really important to take those breaks. Um, wrists are one that I often say. You know, it's rotating your wrists. We tend to hold, twist, bend, and and you know, if you just take a minute and step back. And just roll your wrists around, you know, even when you're typing, if you're cutting food, you're doing food prep, whatever it is, just to give your wrists that little bit of a break. Um, 
oftentimes to you know household chores we really aren't kind to ourselves i i have to say you know we, we tend to to know that it's hurting and we still tend to do it so one of the ones i often do is is um painting i, I love to paint my house and i know that i shouldn't use a short-handed roller uh and i'm reaching and stretching in a, you know, I sort of get halfway through a room and I'm going, wow, my shoulders, my wrists are killing me. And then I go and get the long-handled roller so that I don't have to lift and stretch and reach, that I can stand on the ground and use this long roller. And, and we tend to do that a lot. Um, so what I would suggest there is if you're doing anything that that's, um, requires you to stretch, whether it's working overhead or cleaning bathtub surfaces or scrubbing toilets, if you can find ways to use longer handled equipment, say it's a mop or a brush or whatever, um, so that you're not stretching, so that you're not, um, or kneeling, you might be stretching if it's high, you might be kneeling or crouching if it's low. If you can use longer tools, you're, you're far better off. Um, it takes away that repetitiousness, it takes away the awkward force that's required. Um, it, you know, and I think, I think of, um, I was actually, I was watching this fellow a couple of days ago and, and, uh, Jim, for you, you probably don't have to worry about this in Ontario because you don't get the green mold, but in BC, we get the green mold <laughs> on our houses. <laughs> and so they, people make careers out of cleaning the vinyl <laughs> siding, right? Right. And, and they, if you watch them, they have these tremendously long scrubbing poles, like they go like 30 feet in the air. And when you watch their body posture, they've got that pole and it sits in a little um, little cup around their waist, so to speak. And they use the leverage of the pole and they use their, their whole body weight to scrub the house. They're not trying to put their arms above their head and physically scrub and using all that force and overhead. They're using body mechanics to say, no, 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 no. The pole can do the work, and I just have to control the pole at my waist height. And you can do the same with just changing the type of equipment you're using while you're doing those household chores, whether it's cleaning bathtubs. Uh, Maureen, for you, if you're cleaning bathtubs, um, you probably you know, struggle to have to lean over. I mean, it's one of the most difficult things uh, to do. A long-handled brush that's got a little bit of a kick to it where you can get some extra force would make it much easier for you to, to do those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, just, um, again, back to the stretching. Whatever you're doing, try and mix it up. Try and, you know, different muscle groups, different tasks, rotate the tasks because, quite honestly, too much of any one thing is really simply too much. And I'd like to sort of move quickly into just talking about checking into what you see. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I think of this sort of whole checking in and, and the skills that it takes and, and why sometimes we, we don't check in. And I think, you know, I likened it to, um, because we just celebrated Thanksgiving, um, to when you're cooking a turkey. If you're the cook and you're in the kitchen all day, you don't notice how good your turkey smells. But everybody coming into the house says, oh, it smells wonderful. <laughs> and it, it, it's because you've been smelling it over time and, and your senses have become dull to that smell. Um, I also do one, I, I think about my kids, and I, I think, you know, why don't they see this? And it's, you know, they leave something like a box on the floor. And the first day I'm like, why don't they pick that up? Why don't they see it there? And then after a couple of days, I don't even notice that that box is still on the floor. It's, it sort of goes out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. You just, your senses become dull. And so that checking in is is really important and, and it takes some training. I think a lot of times we um, we we get really task focused. As you know you need to do certain things for your loved ones and and you just get into that task mode and um, you're not 
you tend not to check in at that moment in time. So the example I would use there is um, uh, if you've ever been outside and you've used a weed whacker, you know, your, your task there is you're going to go around all the edges of the lawn and you're going to whack these weeds down. And that's your task. And you typically do it in the summertime, so you have flip-flops on and shorts on and a T-shirt. And as you're doing this task, you're getting bits and pieces of grass flicking up at you, and sometimes you get a piece of gravel flicking up at you. But you focus on the task, and, you know, it's okay. Um, and you do it the next time, and it's okay. And then the next task you're going to look at is cleaning your gutters. So you go get up on the ladder, and the ladder doesn't feel quite secure. So I go, I'm not climbing 30 feet on this ladder. Like, I'm not that crazy. So you do a couple things. Maybe you, um, maybe you tie the ladder off so that it won't tip. Maybe you, you know, fix the landing so it's not uneven and it won't tip. Or maybe you go when you call for help, um, and they're, so that they're stabilizing it. So you still had a task but you've changed what you're going to do. So, so in essence, what you've done there is you've checked in. You've done a risk assessment, and you didn't align sort of the weed whacker with a very big risk. But the ladder did present a risk to you, and you recognized that. You checked in there, and you said, mm, ladder's a risk, but the weed whacker isn't. And maybe the weed whacker isn't the first time or the second time, but the third time, you flick a rock up, and it gets you in the eye, and now you have to put the weed whacker down, and you come inside holding your eye, digging this little rock out of it, and what you're saying at that point is, I knew I shouldn't have done that. You checked in, and you overrode it. So you know there's an element of risk, but we override it because we're focused on the task at hand as opposed to our own personal safety first. And if you're not checking in and checking your own personal safety first, you're putting yourself and your loved one at risk. So that check-in thing, thinking weed whacker and ladder, checking in, are you safe to do this? It, it's, it's really about thinking about yourself and looking at what's around you, how your family member is doing at that moment, um, things can change, you know, minute by minute. So that checking in to, to say, is everything where it should be? Is everything being what it should be? Is the, the person that I care about, are they responding the way that they should be responding? And it's, it's, it's like taking notice of those little small things. Um, maybe even thinking about, you know, how your family member that's in your care behaved the last time. So, you know, if they presented with re resistance the last time you were going to do something, maybe they're going to create resistance this time. And, and what can you do to reduce that risk? Uh, so things to check. We all sort of look, you know, when, when I talk about home support workers, this is a tool that we use with them a lot, and it is totally relevant for you yourselves as, as family care providers as well. And the first is really to take a, a minute to say, you know, is the environment safe? Are, are there things that I need? Um, are the brakes on the bed or the chair working properly? Are they positioned right? Is there room to, to move around them? Um, all those sorts of things. So what is going on in your environment that you need to pay attention to? The second one you'd be looking at is, what about your family member's history? Uh, one, I mean, you work with them every day, you're there every day with them, and you typically know exactly what's going on. But remember I said we sort of get tired after a while and we don't see the little things and we kind of get used to it, we don't smell the turkey. The same thing happens here is it's change over time. So it, it takes sort of tuning in and saying, is there any changes in their behavior? Um, when did they last have some pain medication? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Um, maybe they, you know, 
need pain medication an hour before you do some of their personal care, those sorts of things, to think about that so that you, you know what their history is, you know what they need before you take the task in hand. And then it's sort of thinking about yourself. yourself. And yourself is, is number one, and, and sometimes we don't think of it that way. We think, of course, our, our family member is the one that needs our help, but if you're not there to help, then no one's there to help. So you are number one, and it's, it's kind of thinking those things like, okay, can I do it safely? How can I reduce the risks? How can I um, sort of, we, we call it sort of engineering out the problems, and, and maybe, maybe it's, you know, do I need some new tools? Do I need, um, you know, a, a mechanical lifting device of some type? Do I need, um, you know, a way to reduce the, the um, resistance that I'm going to, those sorts of things. Am I, am I focused? Do I, do I know what I need to do? Do I have everything there? Um, or am I rushed? You know, is it something, oh, I just got to get this done and then I can go, and now you're putting speed on top of it. So is your head in the game? Do you, do you know, you know, what you need to do? And then check yourself and say, is my positioning correct? Am I keeping that neutral posture? And am I avoiding things that could put me at risk? And then the last thing to look at is actually uh, your family member at that moment in time. Is she ready? Um, is he or she following uh, your instructions? Um, can they lean forward? Or they, can they assist you in any way? And if, if they can't, what's changing? What's, what's happening in this situation? Uh, so really checking in. Um, to make sure that all of those four quadrants are sort of, you know, working together, that they're all in line. Um, and doing that before every task, it's, um, you know, uh, getting someone, someone that you love, say, from the bed to the wheelchair, and it works great, and, and they've been able to support, and it's a simple transfer, and that's fine, but they've been up for three hours. Um, check in again when you're about to assist them back to bed. They may be tired. And maybe now they can't do it on their own, and maybe that is a point in time where you need two people, or if you're fortunate enough uh, to have a mechanical lift, um, bring it into play because things do change, and, and their physical condition and their, their mental condition is really important to assess um, at that point in time. And then there's that age-old question of, when do you ask for outside help? And, I, you know, I think this is probably one of the most difficult um, things to do, um, but it's so important to recognize your own limitations. If there is something that is too demanding or, or you think that it's unsafe for you to do, then it is unsafe. There can be nothing more traumatic than to think you might be able to do it and end up um, hurting yourself and your loved one. Um, it only takes a second to make a big mistake. And, and so if you think it is too demanding or if you think that it might be unsafe, then it is. Um, and that's the time when you have to, to ask for help. Maybe it's talk with your family members. Um, look at some creative ways to reduce that risk. Sit and brainstorm some of these things. And, and you know, you might be sort of in a silo. You're, you're you can only see the task at hand, but you know you can't do it. And somebody from the outside might say, well, gee, why don't you try this? And, and so it's that sort of brainstorming creative creative sort of energy, and, and um, maybe you can come up with some great solutions. Um, you know, and, and if you're having some pain, you have to let people know. Somebody needs to know because if you're getting a new pain, something's flaring up, then doing it over and over and again is only going to make it worse to the point in time when you're not going to be able to provide care. We, we see that a lot with our home support workers and, and you know, you may see them come in and they, they may come in with different equipment or maybe they have slide boards or maybe they use transfer belts. Um, maybe they've got some portable mechanical lifts. And the reason they're bringing those in and introducing them is because they're seeing the risk, whether it's um, their feeling pain, maybe they know that they can't handle it, they know that that's a risk to your loved one, so they're doing things to protect them. Uh, 
maybe they are concerned for declining health um, or ability to support, and so they're bringing in tools to reduce that risk. I'm suggesting to you that that's exactly what you too need to be doing and, and working together on some of those things. Your, your um, home support workers may have some great ideas um, because you are a team. You know, if, if you're bringing in home care support and you're there doing a lot of the support, what a great opportunity to look at things differently together and, and how can you make this work so that everybody is safe. Um, you know, it, it just, I just can't reiterate enough that, that injuries can happen in a heartbeat and they can last a lifetime and, and they impact not just you, but your family members and your, that you're caring for and, and your families as well. There is only one of you, and uh, if you're hurt, who's going to take care of your situations? We have time left here um, for some interaction, so that would be fantastic. Uh, Mavis is such a great resource to us. Helpful. So really appreciate all of you for joining us. We are at exactly 8 o'clock, and um, thanks so much. And we will be, uh, I will be posting the webinar recording and the materials on, on our website. Thanks, Mavis. Oh, and thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it, and I really enjoyed it. I'm Great. glad that uh, you got something out of it.